699, Jesus, lover of my soul. <clears throat> by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
A reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept Passover, and in the evening of the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on the very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cake and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day, and they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had money. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is in your bulletin, and let's read responsibly by half verse. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven. And whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt. And in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away. Because, because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. And did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me through trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. Who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked. But mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in God, Christ, we was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, and that in him we might become the righteous of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand for the gospel hymn, Amazing Love.
according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord God. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with, their, with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we'll give the choir just a minute or two to get in place on uh, the front pew. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
So I'm sure you're familiar with the parable of the prodigal son. You've heard it maybe since the time you were four or five years of age. And I want to put it in a broader context today than just the parable of the prodigal son. Remember this, because I'm going to come back to it towards the uh, end of the sermon. What we are struggling with in the parable of the prodigal son, indeed what we human beings have been struggling with from the time we have reached a sense of moral consciousness, whether we were Jewish like Jesus or whether we're Christians or Muslims or anyone else for that matter, we are struggling tight with, with a great amount of tension between justice on one hand and mercy on the other. That's the overriding or overarching issue that is going on in the parable of the prodigal, of, of, of the, of the parable of the prodigal son. That tension that exists between justice and mercy. Now, let's look at that parable in the context that Jews looked at it at the time of Jesus. When it comes to justice and mercy, most of the Jewish teachers of the time, if they erred in one direction or the other, erred on the side of doing justice. They had, after all, forged over a period of hundreds of years certain prescribed ways of behavior that were morally acceptable. And they recorded them, especially in the book of Leviticus. So the Jewish people were not only the chosen people of God, but they were the people who observed the law. And the law was very important to them. Now when Jesus tells this parable, most people are going to side, therefore, with the elder son. And I have to ask you this morning, when you hear this parable, do you side with the prodigal son, or do you side with the elder son? Prodigal son, raise your hands. Elder son, raise your hands. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> what about the father? The father is God. <clears throat> the father is God, Frank. So we're caught in this parable on this spectrum between making sure that justice is done or that mercy is carried out. It's a little bit like what happens when there is no forgiveness in the world and all you've got is a law that needs to be followed and followed to the letter of the law. What happens in a society like that is that ultimately no one is alive. You follow what I'm saying, Kaylee? Yes. If you're only going to live in a culture where the letter of the law is all that is important, then none of us can survive. Because, as Paul says so eloquently in his writings, we are all guilty. And it's true. So what you need to do is to see that mercy has to interact with justice. <laughs> By the same token, what you have to realize is that you just simply cannot throw out justice. 
If you didn't have rules and regulations and ways to behave morally, you would have utter chaos in your society. And I don't care whether it's a Jewish society like it was at the time of Jesus or Christian society in Colonial Heights, Virginia. You've got to have both. And that is what Jesus lays out so well, I believe, in this parable. So let's look at the parable. There is obviously a very, very affluent landowner, and he symbolically is God. Now God has two sons. One is the elder son who wants to see justice is done because the elder son does everything right. The elder son apparently has never gotten into at least serious trouble, kind of like most of us. Most of us. I don't know of any one of you that have served a, a life sentence in jail for murder. But there's also this younger son, the prodigal son screws up. The prodigal son, first of all, screws up by saying that he wants to have immediate gratification. Immediate gratification is something that my children would snicker at when I mentioned it to them, <laughs> because I wanted to establish that, uh, that uh, sense of delaying gratification as a way of living fruitfully over the years. So when I say immediate gratification, like the prodigal son, like the younger son, my children just score, they laugh at me. But the younger son gets what he wants. For whatever reason, the father, who is the God figure, Frank, says, okay, you can do it. If you want your yachts now, you can have them. You have to, you know, go out and make sure that it's the right yacht for you. But whatever you want, you can have. And so the prodigal son says, yeah, I want it. And he takes one half of his inheritance, and off he goes. And he squanders it. I mean, this is such a wonderful, wonderful parable. He goes off and, you know it's coming. He squanders it all. So much so, Jesus gets really kind of literally down and dirty. <clears throat> the prodigal son squanders his portion of the inheritance so badly that he's starting to go hungry and he's eating the food that the pigs eat. I'm not a farmer. But I don't think I'd ever want to eat food that the pigs eat. That's how bad it got. And then comes something that we need to pay attention to. Because in the parable of the prodigal son, he comes to his senses. He comes to his senses. In other words, he sees things differently. You know how I've been talking about the difference between living your life trans, uh, transactionally and living your life transformatively? Well, when the prodigal son comes to his senses, he begins to see his life not as a transaction, but really in terms of transformation. The prodigal son at that point is a new creation. The prodigal son even says, I need to go to my father and confess that I have been a bad boy. Pay attention to that. 
Pay attention to that because it means that <clears throat> transformation has to be manifested. Transformation has to be made apparent. And when the younger son was willing to say what he was going to say to his father, then that transformation took root. It meant something. So the first point about this whole scenario is, yes, the prodigal son was doing the right thing by repenting, by being transformed into the kingdom of heaven, but he had to do something about it. He had to say, as the scriptures say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. In the continuum between justice and mercy, we cannot just give mercy without any kind of acknowledgement that the person is penitent, is sorry, the Jewish society of Jesus' time did not work unless somebody wanted to express penitence, and it still doesn't work today. If we've committed some fault against our neighbor, we cannot just go to our neighbor, say nothing, and expect our neighbor to forgive us. We have to express, or in sacramental terms, confess that we have done something wrong. That's part of the transformational process. And it's part not only of the Jewish history, it's part of Christianity as well. That somehow or another, forgiveness needs to be accompanied by some kind of an action on our parts. When we've been bad, we need to do something about it and ask for forgiveness. So that's the first important thing. The second interesting thing about this parable is that the father already knows that when he sees the prodigal son returning. The father is a shrewd devil, and he knows that his son has already begun the transformation process. That his son is not going to come back to him and say to him, you were a sniveling father. The son is going to come back to the father and say, I erred and strayed like lost sheep, and I'm sorry about it. So that's the second thing. The father already knows, even though the prodigal son repeats for a second time in the scriptures, that he is sorry. He says that to his father directly, even though the father already understands that. Interesting, is it not? In other words, the process of transformation means that we have to be a little bit gutsy in coming to the truth about the way we behave. The third thing, of course, has to do with the elder son. The elder son is still on this extreme of justice. And if that's the only extreme, it's okay, but it's not okay. The elder son wants justice to be carried out at all costs, and it brings the father, the God figure in this parable, into play. Because God has created this world and all that is in it with a sense not only of justice, but of mercy. And that's called survival. 
That's the way human beings survive. I believe that's even the way animals survive. This interplay between justice on the one hand and mercy on the other is ever before us. Look at today's situation in the Ukraine. Now, I am not a big fan of Vladimir Putin. I have said that now for the last four weeks at least. However, I have to be open to the fact that if he shows signs of true repentance, and I mean true repentance, that I have to let the work of God, the father figure in this parable, I have to let that triumph over my own personal feelings about all of the stuff that Putin has done, to the, especially to the Ukrainian people. That there has to be within my sense of following Christ a balance between justice on the one hand and mercy on the other. It does not mean that mercy comes without any kind of acknowledgement of justice. The standards of justice are still in place, but they're not absolute in all cases. They have to bend a little bit. I think that's, um, that's a lesson that mothers know better than fathers. Mothers who have children who uh, sometimes are a little bit mischievous <laughs> can bend the rules a little bit better than fathers. And it's what makes them so beloved by their children. You all can think of instances in your own lives growing up when you uh, <clears throat> erred and strayed a bit, hopefully without any kind of disaster resulting, but you erred and strayed a little bit and you knew that your mother knew it, and yet it was okay. That's the kind of uh, world that brings in gentleness. And we need gentleness. Boy, do we need gentleness. We need to be gentle on others. And we need to be gentle on ourselves. Because that's what makes us human. To be forgiving of ourselves as we are forgiving of others. So that like prodigal children that we all are, we can enjoy the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we were created. Never, never lose sight of the fact that we are created to live in the kingdom of heaven, just as the elder son always has, and the younger son, who has come to his senses, now is living. May God be with each and every one of us. And may we come together as a community of faith, loving one another, holding one another accountable, and forgiving one another as needed. Amen. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and our salvation, beginning down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in the of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated or kneel as you are able for the prayers of the community. Glad and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all you who are true of heart. Having been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, let us pray. Let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayer. Gracious God, you have entrusted your church the ministry of reconciliation. Reconcile our members to you and to each other, and then work through us to embrace the world. Lord, let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayer. Open our hearts to welcome sinners as you welcome us. Give us eyes to see others, not from a human point of view, but as you see them. Lord, let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayer. Jesus, you are the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that our souls may be satisfied, and satisfy our bodies with abundant produce from the land. We give thanks for our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishop Susan, and our Rector John. We give thanks for those celebrating their birthday this week, especially Charlotte, and for those celebrating their wedding anniversary. I invite you to add your own thanksgivings at this time. Lord, let your make mercies embrace us. Accept our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for families. Restore broken relationships. Heal those who have suffered betrayal and alienation. Comfort those whom reconciliation in this life is not possible. Shield those with reason to celebrate. Lord, let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayer. You, O oh God, area hide, are our hiding places for those in trouble. You deliver the oppressed. You forgive the guilty. You roll away the disgrace of your people. We make our prayers to you for those in trouble or need, especially Cookie, Ken and Mary Lynn, Haley, Dick, Thorsten, Tony, Pat, Storm, Christine, Devin, Katie, Vicki, Sydney, Linda, Janie, Paula, Derek, Jay, Nicole, Sharon, Barbara, <coughs> Karen, Pauline, Cindy, and Tom. We pray for those people of Ukraine and Russia who through no fault of their own are caught in the throes of war. I invite you to add your own petitions at this time. For Becky, Pray for the soul of Ignatius. Lord, let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayers. prayers. Holy Jesus, it is our prayer that you may live in us and we in you, both in this mortal life and for all eternity. Lord, let your mercy embrace us. Accept our prayers. prayers. Almighty God, hear the prayers of your people and allow us to be faithful servants of you here on this earth and in the world to come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And now, kneeling as you are able, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess against sin against you in thought, word, and deed, by the Lord we have and by the Lord we have We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we come to repent. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and 
and forgive us, that we may be delighted in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Michael. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due God's name. Bring offerings and enter into God's courts with praise and thanksgiving. Sing with joy.
has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, Dying you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with blessed Michael and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from time and trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And therefore, let us keep the feast.
page 17, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. The closing hymn is Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross.